Now, would you please stand in? I will be reading the scriptures from Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 31. Tell me, you want to be under the law? Are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham has two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. This thing may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stand for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman done of her who is a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. All that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, and the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. May God bless you. This morning we return to our study of the book of Galatians. And you're starting after hearing this morning's text why I was kind of looking forward to the break we took from the study of the book of Galatians. This is not a very easy text. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it other than discussing the fact that there's a logical track here and if you understand the logic it makes sense. If you don't understand the logic you're probably going to be confused. And that reminds me of something else that has returned while we were looking at the Easter messages. Baseball's back. Now, baseball is a fairly simple game to follow. But if you start to get into the nuances of the game and start to do something I learned last summer, or tried to learn, and that's to score a game, it gets a little more complicated. Let me show you what I mean. That is what a scorecard would look for the first three innings of a game. Now, you have a batting order, so everybody's got a number, one through nine. You've got a position number, which corresponds with the positions on the field, which also goes one through nine. Everybody's got a uniform number, and then whatever they do corresponds to the opposite team's number of the player on the position chart on the other teams. That all make sense to you? Now, this one makes sense because we actually have the names of the players. But, you know, there are two guys who made it into the Hall of Fame, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, who never took a pitch, who never swung a bat in a Major League ball game, but took this logical understanding of the game and realized that if you don't have names, it's confusing. I'll tell you how confusing it is. It's so confusing that it would also affect you if you lived in a galaxy far, far away a long time ago. If you don't believe me, check out this clip. We have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You know the fellow's name? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name on first base. Who? 
The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? All I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no. no. What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. What is the fella's name on third base? What is the fella's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. Now, well, you see... We start reading through Galatians 4, and it's the same situation. If I don't know who these people are or what Paul's talking about, I find myself hugging third base and have no idea how I got there. Paul's making a priority of what is first and most important in this gospel. In Galatians, he's making a point of what the gospel looks like, what forgiveness looks like, what grace is. And we have been kind of chugging along, and it's been somewhat easy to understand. And suddenly, Paul gets into the world of analogies, an allegory, and it's pretty gory if you don't know. But see, if you're Bud Abbott, you know exactly what's going on. He knows how to put his scorecard together. Who is playing position three, which is first base? What is position four, which is second base? I don't know is fifth position or third base. The shortstop, I don't give a darn, which some of you probably at this point are in the same category, is position number six. But Paul says, let's talk about this gospel message. And Paul begins by taking it once again and catching us up where we left off. That this gospel of grace is to the works of the law as Abraham is to Moses. Now this is not the individuals Abraham and Moses. These are the covenants. The covenant of promise to Abraham Versus the covenant of Mount Sinai, or of the law, which was given to Moses. The reality is, is that both of these men are men who responded to God's grace by faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11. But the covenants that are associated with them, one is about the law and its works. The other is about grace and the freedom that comes by responding to that in faith. And the reality is, if you're a Jewish person, which is probably where this tension started in the church, as Jewish people came to know Jesus as Messiah, they brought the understanding of the Old Covenant with them. And an understanding that we must work and we must receive the promise. Because that's what the law demanded. And that, that covenant took priority over an earlier covenant. The covenant of promise which had been given to Abraham. Let's just recap what we've already studied on that. Look up in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. What I mean is this, the law, which was introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God, and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, that it no longer depends on a promise, but God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Paul says, the priority and understanding of the story is that God's promise is priority one. All right? We start with promise at first base. And if we don't touch first by the promise, we're never going to see what and I don't know. Do you understand? All right? I can say what and I don't know all day, and you'll go, I, I, I get it. That way, when you say at the back of the door this morning, I don't know what you said. I know you're just at third base. All right. Let's get into the story. The story takes place back in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 16, 17, and then again in chapters 20 and 21. Those are basically the story of this whole thing between Hagar, Sarah, and the two sons. And Paul gives us our, first anal our second analogy in this allegory.